The Carleton College Convocation Program is a weekly lecture series that brings fresh insights and perspectives from experts in a variety of fields. The program has a rich history dating back several decades. The selected convocation speakers assist the liberal arts mission of centering thoughtful conversations within education and beyond. Well, good afternoon, uh, friends, folks, Carlton people. Um, yeah, it's been an honor to introduce Jazz Hampton today. Um, and yeah, I know his talk's gonna be super amazing, right? But before I hand a mic over to him, I'd like to say, does anyone remember the last time you were in a big project, like a group project? What did it feel like? Because to me, I just think about all the things I've been involved in through my four years, pushing five years at Carleton, and the only thing I could think about is, oh my God, it's the people that I work with. It's never about the things, the paper that we write, the software that we produce, or maybe like the trophies that we win. It's always and always has been about the coworkers, the friends, the peers, the classmates that I work with. And I think that's a really big important, that's a really big thing, right? That it's really the culture of the people, the culture that you build of every single team that you're a part of that really, really stands out. So I just wanted to, you know, say that when I have my like one, two minutes here. But without further ado, everyone please give a warm Carlton welcome to Jazz Hampton. Good afternoon, or good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good? I say good afternoon because I have three kids at home, so I've been up since like five o'clock, so uh, I appreciate everyone for coming out today. Uh, my name is Jazz Hampton. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm an alumni of another Mayak school here at the University of St. Thomas, uh, so I'm a big fan of, of anything that is related to our Minnesota schools, and I'm, and I'm honored to be here speaking to all of you today. I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone that made it possible, from, from Noel to everyone else on the team, uh, Matt and Josh this morning as well. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the entrepreneurial journey. Um, uh, I'm thinking one of the things that I would like you to pose or, or think about during this discussion is when you see things in the world, whether it's uh, you were, it was raining a little too much this morning and you were walking in and you didn't have an umbrella, or you're working in groups and teams with other folks day to day, uh, are you thinking critically about what you're doing and the solutions you're building? Uh, that's the thesis kind of of, of what uh, I'll be speaking about today. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that via the story of, of my own background, uh, Turn Signal, and the work that we've done thus far, and hopefully we'll continue to do. Uh, I'll speak about the keys to success in this entrepreneurial journey as well, and then of course I'll have time for a Q&A. And please don't be shy. I always say uh, you can ask me anything, whether it's what did I make the first year when I graduated law school, or what is my favorite food. I'm open to any and all questions, so don't be shy about that. Um, and I'm going to start here with um, what, what do we do? Uh, thinking about trend signal and thinking critically. So before I start, um, I love to do this at the beginning of presentations. Can you show me by a show of hands if you already know what turn signal is? I love it when it's about 50-50, that's perfect. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna to bury the lead and I'm not gonna tell you exactly what turn signal is and what I do for a moment here. Um, but I just want you to, to think back to the moment in 2020. Maybe you were uh, a freshman in college. Maybe you were in high school. Maybe you were about to retire. Um, think back to that summer of 2020 and what the world looked like. All of us were in our houses. Uh, we were in front of screens constantly. Maybe we were just starting those Zoom happy hours, if uh, anyone was doing that like I was at the time. Um, and then we have the tragic loss of George Floyd, right? Um, and it changed our city, uh, the city of Minneapolis, where I live now. Uh, it changed the state and definitely the world. Uh, we thought about things a lot differently. And this was also during COVID. And so people weren't leaving the house. We had a lot more time to think about how we can build solutions. And, and that's what I was doing at the time. So my background, I graduated with a computer science undergrad degree, and then I went to law school. When I was in law school, I was a public defender uh, representing people in Ramsey County when they woke up in prison, or in jail, I should say. Um, then I went on to, to work in corporate law. I was uh, uh, representing large corporations like Walmart and, and Uber. Uh, when they were being sued. I was the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at a law firm of 300 employees across the country. Uh, and I was teaching a law class at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. 
Those were all the things I was doing at this moment in 2020 when the world starts to change. And I was asked to be on a lot of panels. I was asked to be a part of a lot of discussions, thinking critically around how can we solve this problem of tragic endings to roadside incidents. Um, and that's when I started thinking about Turn Signal with my co-founders, Andre and Mike specifically. Um, and so what do we do? Uh, we think about that there's 230 million licensed drivers, uh, there's 32 million traffic stops a year, uh, 9 million accidents, and, and $3 billion in police misconduct settlements in the last decade. It's a lot of money, it's a lot of accidents, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of people. Um, I, I always tell the story about myself being pulled over. I've been pulled over 12 times in my life. I'm, I'm yet to receive a ticket, actually. Um, and I was actually 17 years old driving to the University of St. Thomas where I was going to, 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 to go to school and to play football. Uh, fun fact, I didn't play. I sat on the bench a lot. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, I was going to the University of St. Thomas to play football, uh, and I was going to meet a coach, and I was driving, and I was pulled over by a police officer. I was in my dad's truck. It's like his pride and joy. My dad spent all the money that he had on this vehicle rather than a lot of other things that maybe he should have. Um, it was an Escalade with 20-inch rims, and the, and the officer came up to the window, and she asked me to roll it down, and I did, and she said, I, I don't meet many kids from the inner city uh, that, that don't have a, a criminal record, and you don't have even a speeding ticket, so I'm not going to give you one today, which is why I pulled you over, but I have to tell you, um, if you're in this car, you have to drive slower because you're going to get pulled over every time. And when she said this, she authentically, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, she genuinely was in her mind helping me in that moment. She was saying, I'm, I'm giving you this tip because it'll make it better for you as you drive. It'll make you being pulled over less likely. But what she also was telling me is because of the way I looked in the vehicle I was in, statistically and realistically, I was going to be pulled over more. And that was on my way to college as a 17-year-old. is a really malleable time in my life, and, and I'll never forget that. Um, so I think about those, again, critically thinking about that also in the case of George Floyd and Philando Castile. I talk about Philando Castile who was pulled over just miles away from, from where I was pulled over that day. He had been pulled over 49 times in 13 years, right? 49 times in 13 years. How do we think critically about a solution? And so we put a team together. Um, we, this is when, if you can see on the screen here, um, two guys in the brown coats were my co-founders. That's Mike and Dre respectively. Um, they called me during the summer and they said, Jazz, um, we want to build a solution to make these interactions safer. Uh, we want to we be able to call a lawyer the second that you're pulled over. Uh, and not only do we want to call them, we want you to look at them face to face, be able to see that lawyer and have them walk you through it, just like you walk people through the, the criminal justice system when you were a public defender. How do we do that? They were, they, neither of them are lawyers, and so I immediately launched into lawyer law, Professor Mona. I was like, tell me about pass-through liability. When does an attorney-client privilege start? When are you going to uh, connect them? How are you going to connect them? What kind of services are you using? And by the end of that call, and I always speak the, this to, about my co-founders because I think it's wildly important. Uh, they said, Jazz, will you quit your corporate law job and, and start this company with us that, we, that we've been working on for 30 days already with some other folks in the community, and will you be the CEO? to the team aspect that even Kevin was talking about. What incredible uh, leadership they showed by saying, we don't want to be the face, we don't want to be the leaders, we want you to do it, we've already been working on it, please join our team. I always have to give massive credit to them for, for starting that way, and, and so I did. I always say I went to my wife and said, hey, I know that we have two kids and one on the way, but can I quit my really nice corporate law job to start a company? Uh, and she said, because she works full time outside the house, she said, Jazz, you're on my health insurance anyways, come on, go ahead and do it. So credit to my incredible wife. Um, so we built Turn Signal. Uh, Turn Signal is a mobile platform that allows drivers to connect face to face with an attorney on their phone the second they're pulled over, uh, 24 seven, 365. And our mission and our goal is simple and it's three pronged. It's to protect driver's rights. It's to deescalate these roadside interactions. And third, and, and most importantly, it's to ensure that everyone returns home safely. The drivers, their passengers, anyone else on the road, and of course, law enforcement officers as well. When we started building this, I actually was thinking about my brother uh, on the other end of the, the, the metro area. My brother went to Alexandria Tech's law enforcement program where he graduated from. And so I think, you know, when a police officer sees the bumper sticker on the back of a vehicle that is a turn signal car, and they see that turn signal logo, I want them to actually think, okay, this is actually gonna be the safest interaction I have today. This is being recorded, there's an attorney on the line, and nothing is gonna go wrong. That's what we want them to feel. That's the emotion we wanna invoke in that moment as well. Um, the last, and on the other end, what we're trying to invoke for drivers. 
the last time I was pulled over actually was in my, my wife's hometown of, of Belle Plaine, Minnesota. I was pulled over and the officer asked me to step outside of the vehicle because uh, he thought I had been drinking. I said, I'd be happy to step out. I walked the, the line, I did the nine point uh, pivot turn. Um, I then uh, followed the light in my eyes back and forth. And then finally he asked me to stand on one leg and, and count to a certain number and I did all of those. And the culmination he said, you know, I think you've been drinking and, and you have to give a breathalyzer now. Now, whenever I'm pulled over, I don't ever tell people I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I think it comes off a little, I, don't know, I guess arrogant is the best word I could uh, uh, apply to it. But in that moment, I said, you know, I'm an attorney, and I, I know that I don't have to give a breathalyzer test at this moment, but I'd be more than happy to because I have nothing to worry about. He said, oh, you're an attorney, uh, so you, you, you went to college uh, in law school, so you, you've drank before, you've been buzzed. Are you feeling buzzed right now? And I responded, you know, I wouldn't be able to define the word buzz, and I wouldn't want to give you additional reasonable article suspicion to continue this stop. As I said in the beginning, I'd be more than happy to submit the test. Uh, I did. I was fine. And the only thing that came of that interaction is I was 15 minutes late to the movie that my wife and I were going to. Uh, that is what we're working to provide a turn signal to every single driver in the country, right? A moment to assert your rights in a calm and de-escalated way to ensure you're safe and to get home safe, right, for you and that officer. And so that's the mission that we built. And the timeline of that is what this next slide represents. Uh, so in July of 2020, Philando Castile tragically lost his life. The two guys in the, the brown coats that I showed you above, uh, my co-founders, Andre and Mike, they actually grew up with Philando Castile's family. Um, Andre went to the school that Philando was a chef at at the time, it was on time of passing actually. Uh, direct connections to tragedy in a real way for all of us. And then of course, George Floyd happens in May of 2020. Uh, we all quit our jobs in October, November of, of 2020 as well, and we start to build Turn Signal. We launched it in May of 2021, uh, our, our direct to consumer platform, uh, and then over the course of the next two and a half years leading up until just last month, we worked really hard to become nationwide. And as of last month, Turn Signal is now nationwide in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. Yeah, I see the clap. Appreciate that. Appreciate you, bro. And, and that's how it works. You, when you're pulled over, you just press one button and instantly it calls an attorney. And that attorney is actually practices law in the jurisdiction you're driving in in that moment. So it's not like you're pressing it and you're talking to some random lawyer in California that doesn't know Minnesota laws. You're talking to someone who practices law in that jurisdiction. You can follow their guidance. Generally, I always say that this isn't a, a hand my phone to a police officer app. It's as if um, uh, uh, Kevin was driving and I was in his passenger seat and he was pulled over. Surely, because I'm a lawyer, he would turn to me in that moment and say, Jazz, what should I be doing? Do I get my ID out right now? I'm a little nervous, where should I put my hands? Uh, and that is what the attorneys are often providing in the two to three minutes before that that officer comes up to the window. Uh, and subsequently, you can follow up with that attorney. Uh, you can follow up directly with that attorney if you would like, or you can take that video that is recorded of that interaction to any attorney that you want to. Uh, when I talk about who we're impacting and who we're trying to reach, we always talk about the four P's. These are the, the people who are most often connected to our, our mission, right? So we talk about parents, partners like my wife, uh, and people of color. Um, those are the consumers that are first thinking of turn signals, saying, wow, I need this. Uh, we just had a, a testimonial from a mom uh, in, in another state where she said, I saw your platform five days ago. I downloaded that for my daughter, and I gave it to her. And the, the, two days later, she was pulled over by an unmarked police car and she was terrified. She didn't know if it was really a police officer. She didn't, it was in a rural area where other people weren't around. She didn't know what to do. And she hit that turn signal button. And that attorney guided her through that interaction and made her feel so much more calm and safe in that moment, right? We think about that for our parents. I think about it for my wife. Uh, and we of course think about it for the people of color who statistically are pulled over more, right? Um, and then of course police, uh, if we're making the interaction safer and they walk into that interaction and feel safer, now we can de-escalate the whole interaction. I always say that uh, changing laws can maybe change behavior, but a ring doorbell is gonna make me talk about my friend's landscaping a little less when I approach it, right? I'm on my best behavior and we're implementing the same kind of theory here on a one-to-one -one basis. This is the model, turn signal is, is $60 a year. But what I always love to say is that uh, if you make under $40,000, so any person that tells us they make under $40,000 receives the exact same service that Bill Gates would receive if he was on our platform. And we do not charge them whatsoever. In fact, we don't even take their debit or credit card information. We won't do it. Uh, our mission is to protect people's rights and to get them home safely. And I can't have someone choosing between buying a carton of milk for their family or buying turn signal for their daughter that is driving on the road. 
uh, and so we don't charge them. And we work with incredible partners that help us subsidize those memberships. Uh, partners like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota Vikings, and, and many, many others. Uh, and these numbers are actually outdated. We have a, a, right around 100,000 downloads, and we have tens of thousands of active monthly users and several covered lives. We have over 200 calls a month on Turn Signal. I was giving a presentation yesterday, and one of the questions was, what, what is something that gives you the most joy in the business? And, and in the entrepreneurial journey, uh, sometimes you, you work on the business more than you work in the business, and you, you get removed from what is happening day to day. But it's reading testimonials from those 200 people a month that, that just explain that this gave them peace of mind that really gives me energy and life every day. Uh, and, the, and it's growing, and we're, we're working really, um, really hard on integrating with other systems like Ford and, and other platforms so that we can be tied in more directly to, into vehicles and, and other platforms as well. Uh, this is just what we've earned and, and some, some notable uh, achievements, which I'm, I'm going to skip to speak next uh, about looking ahead on what turn signal is. If you, again, think about our mission, it's to connect drivers to uh, a professional service, to a lawyer in their moment of need. And we can do that same thing if I just remove two of those words. We can connect uh, someone in a mental health crisis to a professional in their moment of need. We can connect um, someone with, uh, with addiction needs to someone that they need in that moment. Uh, that's the vision of Turn Signal to do so much more than just connecting drivers uh, and attorneys. It's connecting individuals in need with the professional services that they need as well. And so what are, what's my advice to entrepreneurs? What am I suggesting to you as, as you go out into the world. And, and I always like to, to give a caveat here. When I say the word entrepreneurs, I don't mean someone who just started an LLC or someone who just started a C Corp or, or someone who just started a nonprofit. Uh, if you are working in a large business, uh, your section of the business, the, the part of the business you're working on is yours and you are an entrepreneur within that system. Uh, we're all entrepreneurs in that sense. We're all building something, whether it's a part of a larger organization or it's a company that you just started. So when I, when I say entrepreneur, I want you to think of it in that context. Um, and so what's my, my guidance to you? Um, first, it's use your experience. I cannot tell you how often someone will hear of Turn Signal and hear what we do and say, wow, what a, what a great idea. Why hasn't that been done already? I get it all the time. And I think my genuine answer is, it's because it took three black men from Minneapolis, the, the epicenter for a call for social change, that one of them, myself, was a computer science major with a law degree. The other uh, was a, a finance accounting background, uh, and he was and just completed his MBA. The third was a tech salesperson uh, with his MBA as well. We had all of the skills and experience, both in life, professionally, and educationally, to build something. So again, what does that mean for you if you, in an entrepreneurial context? Um, it, when I was sitting in your chair, I wasn't thinking I'm going to start Turn Signal next, next week. I thought I'm going to get a, get a computer science degree. I'm going to learn how to, to code and build apps. I then thought I'm going to go learn the law and I'm going to try to be effective in my execution and advocacy within the legal space. Uh, I then learned about diversity, equity, and inclusion and started building uh, the case for inclusion both in the law and outside of the law directly. All of those things culminate, I would say they're tributaries to the larger river that is my current career, that is turn signal, right? And so that is the first start of your entrepreneurial journey is you're, you're building skills. It doesn't have to be today. I don't want everyone to leave this auditor or to leave this chapel and think, I have to go start a company. I want you to think, I'm gonna build all the skills that I need so when that opportunity comes, I will be ready to execute upon it and build something really meaningful. Um, and that is always, I always like to highlight educational personal, professional. So think about those experiences. Um, the other is, is build things with people you care about. Again, to, to your point earlier, um, Andre and Mike, my two co-founders, they, they've known each other since they were three years old. They grew up in the church together, actually, in St. Paul. And I met them, again, on the bench at the University of St. Thomas as we were waiting for other players to come off the field. Um, and I always say that, that we built something together because we could move at the speed of trust, because we really trust each other. People are like, oh, you guys are friends, that's cool. Like, no, Andre got married last summer, or last August, I should say, uh, and Michael was his best man and I was the officiant. We are close. Um, and it's really important because we can build something and, and really be uh, open and honest with each other as we're doing it. I always talk about the three rules of engagement that we have together. One is we always hold each other accountable. We always say, like, I'm always willing to pull up, and that's what we do. I'm always willing to, to hold my co-founders accountable, um, and you should think of that in your journey as well. 
Uh, the second is, is we always enter the, the, any conversation serious or, or really important or maybe even not as important with a, a I won't die on this hill mentality. So I, it's, it's like an intro phrase or intro clause that I use way too much. I'll say, hey, you guys, I think that we should hire, I won't die on this hill, but I think that we should hire a new salesperson to do X, Y, Z. And then we have a discussion. And at the end of that, I reserve the right to change my mind, and I do. Um, and to that point, the last one we have is collectively, uh, we have one veto a year. Uh, there can be a two, three vote. Uh, and Mike and I will both agree we absolutely have to hire this new person. Uh, and we give each, or, uh, each of us one veto per year that can absolutely veto any decision that we're going to make collectively. Um, but I always say the power of that veto is what holds us accountable because none of us have used it once yet. Uh, the closest we came actually was last week, and, and, and Andre said, I think I'm going to use my veto. And I said, then, then let's not do it. I want to hear more about your perspective. And we all agreed at the end of that conversation. Those are the three rules of engagement to, to keep in mind, at least the ones that we use, is, is don't die on the hill, allow a veto, and hold people accountable. So what about the other people in the room? Maybe if you're a professor or you're a mentor, I have a few pieces of guidance as well. And the first is, is to be honest with the people that you're mentoring. Don't hold back. You always have to be honest, because if you do, I guarantee you'll regret it. Um, I have a great mentor who always gives me a, a plan A. He says, okay, plan A is this. I think that you should hire in this space. I think you should hire two people, and I think you should grow the team really quickly. Sometimes I, I disagree with it. But what I love about that mentor is it, they say, if you aren't gonna do plan A, which I suggest, let me help you then with plan B. Don't abandon someone, the person you're mentoring, when maybe you disagree with the ultimate choice or they don't follow the first step of guidance that you give. Uh, the second for mentors uh, is to take notes and follow up. I can't tell you how often I, I'll, I'll go to a follow-up meeting with a mentor and, and <laughs> specifically one, uh, his name's Tom, and Tom will open a notebook and say, last week you said that you were gonna do X, Y, and Z. Did you do that? How did, how did you feel about that? Did it yield the results you wanted to? And if not, what are you going to do differently next time? Uh, that hold it, you taking those notes and then asking those direct questions and, and again, holding someone accountable is incredibly uh, powerful. And the last one, and this comes from my time in law school and, and teaching in law schools as well, is to be Socratic, but be nice, right? Um, don't say the best thing you can do is to start expanding nationwide right now. Say, why are you staying in, in the Midwest? Do you see value in going outside of the Midwest? What are the challenges in going outside of the Midwest? What would be the positives to going nationwide? These kind of questions help lead that person to the answer uh, and ask them questions that maybe they didn't want to answer out loud, but if you've ever read Atomic Habits, uh, speaking something out loud makes it a lot more real in your life. Uh, and, and being Socratic and letting those people build to that is an incredible part of doing that work. Uh, finally, uh, if I have to summarize everything, um, whether you're working within a team and you want them to think critically or, or you're working um, on building a business, I always want you to think, please always think, how can I build a solution that will be the answer to the problem? Um, if you don't identify the problem and start building a solution to it, you'll just be floundering. And as I think Zig Ziglar always says, uh, if, if you don't know what you're aiming at, you're going to hit it every time. Right? And so think critically about what the problem is and start building a solution that can directly address that. Um, with that, I'm really excited to be here and, and answer some questions. And I really, again, encourage you all to, answer, to ask questions, whether it's about being an entrepreneur, uh, from fundraising to uh, starting the business and MVP, uh, or about my personal background. I'm more than happy to, to answer some questions on that as well. Thank you. And thank you very much, Jazz. As Jazz mentioned, Q&A time, and don't hold back. It sounds like everything is on the table. Let's hear from you. Who would like to start off the Q&A? And we have one immediately back here. That is wonderful. Hi. Um, great speech today. Um, so I've had a lot of people, especially lawyers, say, don't go to law school, you'll regret it. What do you have to say to that? Um, the, so many variables in, in that decision. First of all, thank you for the question. Um, I loved law school, and I, I did not like any course or grade that much that I took, or grade or course that I took prior to that. 
Um, and I am a slow learner. If it takes someone in this room an hour to read something and comprehend it, it takes me two and a half. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. Um, and it, it was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. I always say, if you're going to go and be a dentist, that's great. Uh, but you, you can't take your dentist degree and do a million different things in the way that you can with a law degree. I know lawyers in DEI. I know lawyers that are litigators. I know lawyers that are the presidents of the United States. I don't know any presidents, but you get what I'm saying. Um, I think it's an incredible Swiss Army knife that teaches you how to think critically um, and, and gives you a lot of opportunities in different spaces. Of course, there's financial implications and, and a lot of other things. Uh, but, you know, when I went to law school, I did it for two or three reasons, three reasons. One, I, I wanted at the end of the day to help my community, the black community. Um, two, I loved like uh, competition and I wanted to be a litigator. I always say, um, I, I think of law like sports and suits and I played football on the bench at St. Thomas and the playlist before a game at the University of St. Thomas that I listened to uh, was the same playlist I would listen to on my way to the Minnesota Supreme Court to argue a case because it released the same endorphins. It gave me the same kind of feel. I love litigation, but if you don't love that, there's m &A work, there's a lot of other stuff you can do. Uh, and, and the third reason I did it was because I thought it was gonna make me rich. I was wrong on that front. <laughs> uh, but I, I highly value my legal education and, and I love the law. And I think that it sets you up for so, the way that I even view political situations now is, is steeped in a knowledge of the constitution that I did not have prior to law school and I couldn't have articulated it. So I, maybe take a larger sample size because I, I love law school. Uh, it was some of the best three years of my life, actually. So I have a personal question and then a, and a, a question about your presentation. Yeah, please. Your first name is Jazz. Do you play any instruments? <laughs> yeah, I love that personally. I don't. I, my parents tried to get me to play violin when I was younger, and I stopped at Dirty Doggy Scrub Scrub. was the last song that I learned. Uh, I wasn't too skilled at the violin. I wish I had say for sure. And people ask me if I'm connected to any musicians or like Lionel Hampton, any jazz musicians. I'm not. I probably wouldn't have gone to law school. I would have been on a beach somewhere. So no, don't play any instruments. And then have you gotten any feedback from law enforcement about their interactions with people or cars that have the turn signal bumper sticker? Bumper sticker? Yeah, um, that's a, it's a great question. Actually, one of the most common questions I receive, I should just build it into the, to the deck, actually. Um, uh, when, we, when we started Turn Signal, before we even started building it, we interviewed over 20 law enforcement officers to get their perspective and opinion on what we were building. Excuse me. And, um, and some of those opinions are, were built into the platform. One of them was, uh, I don't want to sit there and wait for 20 minutes and have someone go, well, man, I'm waiting for my lawyer. There's like, and Nate in St. Paul was like, I'd be very upset if I came to a car and that would happen. And so we built a system that would expedite the calling process, which I guess is proprietary. Um, and so that was the start of receiving feedback. Uh, and then we also, every single attorney on our platform, all hundred, there's hundreds and hundreds on the platform, would have to go through a third party de-escalation training before they're allowed on our platform. And they're all, they all are trained to know that should an officer ever give an order to get off of the phone, to hang up, to, any, to do any of those things, uh, which if they even deem as wildly unconstitutional or unlawful, they follow orders. Uh, that's how we set up our system because the number one of those three prongs is to get everyone home safely. But guess what you now have? You have a recording of what you believe to be an, an unlawful or unconstitutional order that was given, you following it, and a lawyer to follow up about it. We're setting you up for the best case scenario after, and so when we explain that to law enforcement officers, they actually really appreciate it. I like going on tours giving presentations to law enforcement. And I can't tell you how so often I go into the room and there's a perception, there's a tension in the room. By the time I leave, they'll come up to me and say, I'm going to get this for my son or daughter. Or, or my, uh, recently in LA, one of the officers said, my son-in-law is still so like, nervous around law enforcement, even though I'm a part of that community and he needs to have this on his phone. Um, people often give the analogy of body cameras where there's a lot of trepidation or hesitation around body cameras for officers, but then they learn that this is actually going to make their experience better. There's a video showing that they did what they were supposed to do. Uh, so we, we put ourselves in a, in a similar vein to that. So yet to receive a negative call from law enforcement.
Hi, thanks for being here. Um, were there uh, other experiences besides um, playing on the bench on um, the football <laughs> team in college? Other things that um, you participated in or experiences that you had that you feel like contributed to um, some of your success and being able to be an entrepreneur and, um, and do this startup? Yeah. Um, th oh, thank you for that question. And there's so many. In fact, when I decided, I ultimately quit football my, my second year. And when I did that, I made a conscious choice. I said, if I'm not doing this, I have to be involved in other things. So I was the class at University of St. Thomas. I was the class president junior and senior year. So I was involved in student government. I was the president of a performing arts club called Pulse, which did like uh, dance and, and other performing arts uh, shows every two years. It was the largest club on campus, actually. Uh, I, I played rugby. I got involved in a lot of other things for a, a few reasons. One, it built a lot of those skills. I had to... Uh, we, had, we had to hold elections or, or to assign people to like boards and committees within that organization. That means someone had to get their heart broken when they didn't receive that spot and tough conversations to have. Uh, when I was, when I was um, doing student government, when uh, we had to go to rooms and have conversations and, and follow the like rules of decorum and seconding votes and doing those processes, I, I hadn't touched that before. I'm now on four nonprofit boards from the Minneapolis Foundation to Catholic Charities and a whole bunch of others where I now have those skills that help me lead into what I'm doing now. Um, and, and the last part is I just, I wasn't, again, that gifted in the educational space. And so it bridged the gap a lot where someone might look at my resume and say, oh, this GPA isn't the best, but look at all these other things that they're involved in. Maybe that he'd be a good fit within our organization, within our team. Um, those soft skills, you know, if you're in engineering or accounting or computer science, you're learning very specific skills, uh, but I think in, in, in college you have a chance to really develop those soft skills of working with people uh, and learning how to be a team player and all of those associations and groups were a big, big part of that for me. Yeah. You got one? Uh, yeah, I know in a lot of the conversations that we have around social justice causes and initiatives, uh, DEI and equity, things along those lines, uh, a lot of things sort of default into the nonprofit sector. Could you tell us a little bit about why you chose the approach that you did? I know that you have the foundation as well that runs alongside. Uh, and then just maybe just a broader discussion about how you see uh, the for-profit sector playing into or enacting uh, socially just practices uh, on a broader scale? Unbelievable question. Um, and it's funny because it's in my notes on this presentation. I didn't touch on it. Um, we did have to decide if we were going to be a nonprofit or for-profit entity. Um, and as I said, I'm on four nonprofit boards. I go to all the galas. I'm a part of all the fundraising conversations. Uh, it's really tough work. Raising money for a nonprofit is really tough work. There's a lot of people, and, and you go in a room, it's like, uh, you, and you're in a presentation, everyone's fighting for the same grant, and at the end of it, you're like, oh, geez, I don't even want my nonprofit to get the money, give it to that one, right? Uh, it's a really tough, and Minnesota's the land of nonprofits. Um, it's, I've, so I saw firsthand on all those boards that I'm on that that, that work is really difficult. Uh, and what I saw, connecting to your second part of your question is, I saw a, partner, a way to partner with businesses and say, this is going to be something that helps everyone. Uh, it helps your business, because I guess what I didn't refer to in my presentation is Turn Signal, we all, also offer it as an employee benefit. So right now, if you work at Children's Minnesota Hospital, if you work at um, iHeartRadio, if you work at uh, like 30 other companies in the Minnesota and beyond, you receive Turn Signal as a benefit to your employment, just like you receive health and dental. That, when, so when we started building, I was like, yeah, we can give it to people for free that can't afford it, but we can also work with businesses to say, hey, if you work at our organization, we have a DEI committee, and I bet every organization does. And we have a mission statement around that, I bet every organization does. Here's how we stand behind it. Turn Signal is a piece of that larger mosaic that says, this is how we're showing to you that we actually care about you in a real and authentic way. We're giving you something that can be helpful. Um, I knew that that could be a part of the business model as well, and, and that was my way of trying to lean out of the nonprofit space. Uh, I just didn't want to raise money forever. And I wanted to prove that um, this value proposition goes beyond donations. It goes beyond any of that. It goes to helping people in a real way. And we can do that in a you know capitalistic society. So I think I saw one over here. Yeah. Thanks. 
Hi, hello. So uh, I'm looking from an identity expect, uh, experience. So as a woman of color, you know, having a, a law school degree and stuff like that, um, practicing law is very prestigious. How did you navigate those internalized emotions and how do you um, give, you know, influence of someone wanting to take that step to step away from, you know, a prestigious job like that into, you know, turn? Yeah. Um... You, you really hit the nail on the head. And not to belabor these sports analogies, but um, going from practicing law and being a litigator to even being in-house as a lawyer or not working in the actual like, practice of practicing law day to day, uh, it's like going from being like the star quarterback to an offensive lineman. It's like there's way less glory, there's less prestige. Uh, for other people who love Bravo TV, it's like being a main cast member on Real Housewives of Salt Lake City to being like a friend of. It's like a, it feels like a step down. I love Bravo. Um, it feels like a step down, and and there's like an ego shot to it. And and I will say, not undeservingly, lawyers have a, a, a reputation for having egos, right? Um, what I had to do, when I was, I graduated law school, I think at 23 or 24 years old, I was, I was still pretty young. And, and one of the, the last class I took in law school was a class called uh, uh, Ethical Leadership. And one of the things we had to do was write our personal credo on what we wanted to do in our life. And at the end of it, what we wanted people to say about us and if we lived up to that credo. Uh, and during that class, I wrote that I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to get a good job. I wanted to pay off my student loans. I didn't do that yet. Um, I wanted to pay off my student loans, support my family, and then leave the practice of law to use my law degree in a way that fulfills me personally and helps my community. That's what I wrote when I was in law school in my third year. That, that just was more important to me in that moment. Um, and whether or not people thought it was cool that I was leaving a really great litigation job or, or whether they looked down on me saying he must not have been able to cut it, that's a, a fear. Um, what I knew is I was doing what I thought lived up to my personal credo, and that was the most important thing. Don't get me wrong, it came with some, some worry at night about people thinking that maybe I wasn't the best litigator, but I'll live with that. It's no problem with me. Thank you for the really excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more. You mentioned this briefly, but elaborate more on some of the big picture ideas moving forward, like moving to other services, right? You talked about addiction or mental health, things like that. If you could speak a little bit more to that point. Yeah, there, there is um, there's a, a, a product roadmap that first starts with what we're doing now, connection to attorneys when you're in the vehicle. Uh, and so now it's an app. Uh, we're working on integration with one of the big tech companies on building it into the dashboard of vehicles so that the attorney will show up on the screen. Uh, we've actually started building that, it's great. Um, we are working to integrate with other platforms. If you think of Uber drivers, for instance, uh, they're people of color that often that, that drive the most, maybe English is their second language and their car is their means of income. So having someone there, whether you've just been in an accident or being pulled over is more valuable to them than anyone else. So we want a button in the vehicle so we can connect directly to those Uber drivers, right? Uh, those are kind of in the car on the current version we're doing now. The future, um, honestly, it started from people reaching out to us, from healthcare organizations reaching out to us saying, hey, we have telemedicine or, or teledoc or whatever the company is, but you set an appointment, it's three days later, how are you building an on-demand system with other professionals uh, that will answer right away? Uh, and there's a great opportunity to do that, I think, in the medical space first. Um, we are, I, I always say turn signals like the ER for law, and so I would love to build something like the ER for medicine as well, um, just because I think it's the closest in an analogous sense. Um, we also are having a lot of conversations around uh, folks with, with varying addiction needs, um, and having someone there on demand could really help save lives in a, in a different way. Um, those are what we're on the road maps, but the fact of the matter is, as I touched on earlier, I'm the lawyer with a computer science degree. My two co-founders are from tech and, and, and accounting. We don't have someone in those other spaces, uh, and so it takes expanding the team to do that, and, and to the point earlier, that takes finances, and so it's something that, you know, we, we raise venture capital money to build TurnSignal, and it'll have to be another round of venture capital raising to do that work, uh, do it well. Um, I'm a firm believer in if I'm going to start, I want to do it well. So we have to bring in those funds to, to do that first. What were some of the challenges you faced in building and rolling out turn signal, and how are we able to overcome them? 
Yeah, I think the first challenge to maybe to the to the endpoint that I just had was was money, right? It takes it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to build the app if you're not going to do it yourself, uh, as in if you're not going to code it yourself, which we did not. Um, it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then you know I have I had two, now I have three children at the time of starting Turn Signal. My co-founders each have kids. Uh, there's a lot of people who start businesses uh, before they get far into life. Maybe they're living in Uptown on a shoestring budget eating ramen. Uh, I couldn't do that with my wife. She'd be upset with me. So uh, it was raising money to ensure that we could even start the process. That was really challenging. And in Minnesota, uh, when it comes to raising money and to, to giving out money, I always say we think ketchup is spicy. Uh, it, there's a lot of hesitation around uh, fundraising and they want to see a lot of traction before you can do it. And so what we had to do is we had to start building a, a minimum viable product to show people, to give them a real sense of what they were doing, and then also find partners that prove that they would work with us. Um, to someone's earlier question, and it was your question about uh, the, the working with businesses and, and doing that work, uh, what I did was I went around and I took screenshots of, if you think back to June 1st of 2020, uh, if you had Instagram, it was Blackout Tuesday and everyone was posting with Black Square. I went around and took screenshots of every business Every single one, I have them all. They're still on my computer. And I would sit down with Caribou Coffee. Uh, who's right here? I would sit down with Caribou Coffee and I'd say, here's what you posted on June 1st. And I would read it to them. I'd say, I'm so happy you posted this and uh, I'm excited about you understanding the need here. Uh, I have a solution and I would like you to be a part of building that solution with us. Uh, that's how we started that program, and I say that probably because Caribou Coffee did help us. They were part of the, the first businesses that jumped on and helped in the work that we were doing. Um, we had to do that in order to ensure that Turn Signal could even get off the ground, let alone continue to grow. So those were the early chances. challenges were definitely financial, as most businesses are. I have a question about the computer science part of your background. Mm -hmm. Were there any experiences or other things in the classroom or outside of the computer science piece that would be really valuable for future students? Uh, w things that were valuable from my time in computer science? So I'm a CS professor, so what yeah. can I do or what can I encourage students to do to help them? What are things that you have taken away that maybe are not expected that were really valuable? Yeah, well, the first is, even if, and this is, again, directly to my personal experience, the first is, uh, I didn't code Turn Signal's platform. I didn't develop myself. Um, but I knew what, what I was looking for. And, and my wireframe was better than any other non-computer science wireframe that would be sent to our developers because I really understood what I was trying to build. Um, so even having the baseline knowledge is incredibly important, right? And then the second part is, I know the capabilities within the systems. Uh, and so now when I'm talking to them and I'm saying, well, can't we just do a switch statement or a, a, something along these lines to, to solve this problem? Or can we use a deep link to get to this end result that we're trying to get to? Um, it, it just makes the process so much easier. And the other thing is people who don't have the computer science, it's like when you're in it, you think that everyone knows what you know. Uh, everyone didn't get my Bravo joke because everyone doesn't watch Bravo. Um, when you're in it, you think everyone knows it. Uh, and so what's important for them to understand as well is you have a core understanding of what this technology can do that other people can't apply. Other people can't think of it and, and applying it to pro modern day problems in the way that you can because you understand it. And so having them think critically around how to take the knowledge they have and put it to the problem is really important. They all have the core knowledge of they, they know how to make the switch statements, but do they know how to think about applying it to a problem they see in the world? Um, you may have answered this question earlier, but um, do you see turn signal like, specifically regarding like police stops, like becoming something that's like perfunctory, like oh yeah, you used to get stopped with police, you like turn on turn signal, or do you hope that it eventually becomes obsolete because it kind of like pushes police departments to change, or do you, are, are both things true? I don't know. Um, I was smiling because it, uh, you, it's that your phrasing is what I used when I started. The, these conversations started uh, presenting turn signal and the idea of turn signal. And I use the word ubiquity, right? Like I want in the way people are like, oh, like I, 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 gotta, I gotta run to a happy hour with my friends, I'm just gonna grab an Uber, right? Like it's, it's the language, it's the nomenclature. That's what I want turn signal to be. I want to be like, oh, I was pulled over yesterday, but I, I used Uber, or I used turn signal, it's all good. That's how I want people to think about it. And then to, your, to the other half of your question is maybe it'll correct and maybe it'll make turn signal obsolete. Uh, if, if 
police actions are, are becoming better. And, and my personal view on that is uh, if I go to the gym for six straight months, I will be in better shape. And I won't say, I'm going to stop going to the gym now because I'm in better shape. I have to maintain that in sh to ensure that I remain in good shape. And that's what we do turn signal as well. While it can get us to the place we need to be, it's still being there is what keeps us on that healthy pathway forward. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> I'm really curious about the, um, you said you have uh, attorneys in all states across the country. I'm really curious what that recruitment process has looked like and, and how you've been able to get connected with so many different offices. Can you go more in depth on that? Yeah, um, it's by far the hardest part about Turn Signal. We thought we'd be nationwide uh, within six months when we launched and it took two and a half years. Um, and it was all about building the attorney network. Uh, and we've tried six different versions of finding them. Uh, but what I always say is we, what we came down to is we found the three reasons they wanted to be a part of Turn Signal. One, and it's some of them were all of them, some of them were one of them. One is altruistically. People just want to be there for people in their moment of need. Judge Allen is a retired judge in Scottsdale, Arizona, and just he loves answering calls. It's like his favorite thing to do. This man will, he almost answers all of them in Minnesota. He's amazing. Uh, for altruistic reasons. The second is, is brand building reasons. The people who are answering are either criminal lawyers or personal injury lawyers on the accident side. Um, and, and it's hard to build a brand around that. And they can say, hey, I'm the type of attorney that's here for people on turn signal. Uh, and I'm not expecting money from them. I'm not coming after you for your money. I'm just here to help you and it can build a brand. And the third is, is uh, client following, right? Uh, I can't tell you how many times people answer and say, oh, the traffic stop went well, but hey, my cousin has this criminal matter. Would you mind talking to them and helping them out? It's a great way to build a network as an attorney as well. Uh, so that's the value proposition that we speak to when we're going around the country, but it took a very, very long time, especially in Delaware, it was so hard. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the relationship between like the user of your app and the attorney. So does the attorney actually represent the user? Or like if the situation escalates and like the user actually needs an attorney in like court, would that user go and find that attorney again? Or how would that work? Yeah, um, so we, the attorney's given legal guidance and it's a consultation. The beauty of that within the law is uh, if you were to, if someone were to call a divorce attorney right now and say, hey, think about getting divorced. My husband uh, was flying all around the country. He's not around the house anymore. I need, I need him present more. He's not, I need a divorce lawyer. And they don't use that lawyer. That conversation is still privileged. Um, you were saying things with, under the guidance that you may retain this person as your lawyer. So privilege actually activates before they become your counsel. Um, privilege starts before they become your counsel and we're in the same position here at Turn Signal, right? And so they have to keep your secrets, but you don't have to use them as your lawyer. However, if you want to follow up and use them, you're more than welcome to. And at the end of the call, we ask three questions. Do you want to hang up right now? Would you like to talk to an attorney further about this interaction? And the third is, would you like to speak to this attorney again about this interaction? And if you say yes, we remove the firewall and let you exchange communications with them. Before that, that attorney does not have, even have your contact information. So do attorneys like to use this to find work then? Yeah, if it leads to them retaining more people, it's great. And, and the beauty of it is it's not like they have to sit in a call center and wait all day. It's just if you're available and can answer the call and help the people, you can. And then if you want to follow up and help them, you can do that as well. So some attorneys have retained clients from the platform for sure. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. As Turner Signal's grown, how has the demographics of its users changed? Yeah. Um, it was not a lot of things in terms of surprising, but this did surprise me. Um, our, our demographics typically mirror, if you think about it on a jurisdictional level, the, the population of that jurisdiction. So in Minnesota, our, our demographics mirror the, the people within Minnesota. Um, it doesn't skew too heavily to people of color. Definitely socioeconomically, it's to people who are a little more impoverished or, or struggling financially. Uh, but it usually represents the, the demographics of that state. So in California and Texas, we have more Hispanic users. Uh, and we have to think about how we're going to address the language barriers in those jurisdictions, right? And so it, it follows demographics pretty closely, actually. 
So you kind of answered the question I was going to ask in that, which is how you mentioned people who have English as a second language before. How do you get lawyers that maybe speak Spanish or a different language? How do you like organize that? Yeah, we definitely struggle in the practice of law in diversity. And so there are less Hmong speaking or Hmong attorneys that are available in the state of Minnesota than we would like, right? Uh, and so we work really hard and that is like a key part of our product roadmap is how do we in, like in, enable language services um, the, the naturally though, again, to the demographics, um, in Georgia, half of our attorneys speak Spanish. In, in Texas, it's similar, and in California, it's similar. Uh, then to build it so it specifically bifurcates a system, again, thinking of computer science, like I know that I can set up a system that'll, that'll move certain users into a flow that'll only connect them directly to Spanish-speaking attorneys um, is what we want to move towards in the future. But then there's a million different iterations of that, right? Uh, people of, of varying levels of, of documented status right um, if you are pulled over and you are not a, a legalized citizen in that moment that is your main you could you could be driving without a driver's license you could be driving with no wheels on your car that is the most important thing in that moment and so that attorney needs to know that and be able to address that really quickly uh, people uh, of di different hearing and, and speaking of like a million different var varieties of what we need to implement to make it more inclusive so definitely working on it I'm going to jump in with a question, if yeah. I may. Were there any times when turn or any time when turn signal almost didn't get off the ground, or were there any objections <laughs> like you can't do this or anything like that? Um, you know, there's a lot of folks who who saw different stages of the business and thought. And I'm thinking specifically of investors. We, you get a lot of no's, uh, and but I, what I will say is a lot of them said, "I don't think you'll be able to." X. I don't think you'll be able to scale the nationwide. I think it's a localized. I think this is a, a point in time need and it, and it won't continue. I think so. We hear a lot, we heard a lot of those. And what I, you know, uh, I heard a lot of, oh, you're doing this in the wake of George Floyd. Do you think this is going to go away? That's a phase that this conversation is going to stop. And we started again in October of 2020 and we launched in May of 2021, eight months later. 45 days before we launched, Dante Wright lost his life six miles from our office, right? We, if it was just a flash in the pan, I wouldn't have quit my job. It was a very nice job. Like, but it, but it, it wasn't. We knew this is a pervasive issue. Uh, and so we knew that we could build something to make everyone feel safer in that moment. So that was the, the main one that almost prevented us from getting off of the ground uh, and also finding the attorneys. The first 25 attorneys was a really, really difficult uh, stretch because there's no proof point. We couldn't say, these other 100 attorneys are on the platform. We couldn't say, would you like to talk to one of the other 25 attorneys in California that do it? Uh, they had to be first movers, and uh, the profession of law is one of the most archaic. If you go to court in a lot of like metropolitan area uh, criminal justice system, they give you your, your legal documents on one of those three, like a yellow, pink, and white paper that you rip off one. They still use those, and they don't even have computer systems to document the process. Uh, we're slow to adopt technology, so that was difficult. Well, it looks like that might be the end of the Q&A, but do you have any concluding comments or? Uh, just the last thing I'll say is I, I appreciate everyone for coming in and for watching online and uh, whether it is quitting your job and doing something new or just improving something within your current role and, and current work you're doing, I encourage you to think critically and really push the bounds on what's already happening. Thanks. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you all for coming very much. We'll see you next week.